Hi, how are you doing, Bill? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you for joining me today. For those who don't know, Bill Oliver is the director of the Tribeca film, Our Son, which features a couple, Gabriel, played by Billy Porter, and Nikki, played by Luke Evans, who are a gay couple who decide over the course of the film to head to a divorce. I'll leave it at that, not give up some of the character pieces in it, but it is playing June 10th at the Indeed Theater. That's where you'll have your world premiere. And ironically, and I say this ironically because you mentioned Angelica in the film, two of your films are actually at Angelica June 11th and June 14th. So I thought that was a fun touch. I, You know what? I hadn't even realized that until you pointed that out. Yeah, I was worried because the Angelica owns the Village East now, and I have friends who are like, I'm worried they're going to go to the original Angelica and not to the correct place. <laughs> so thank you for the reminder. Yeah, I was just, I make notes while I watch the films just for my own notes to be like, oh, hey, here's a thing that was noticed that I might not have picked up on. And I was like, wait, did she mention Angelica? Oh, she did. And then I looked up the Tribeca page and I'm like, sure enough, they're playing at the Angelica. Yeah. Not planned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. not planned. But jokes aside, let's get into the actual film instead of where it's playing. So I'll say for one, I loved that you set up the drastic differences between the Nikki and Gabriel really early on. There, it, that was just fascinating to me the, to plant the seed. I want to say, what, it was five minutes in to the movie. They're going to bed, and they just have totally different routines. One you could see as the quote-unquote mom, and one as the dad who's, I'll oh, just do this, just do that. So I guess, how did you want to cast that when you have two different, entirely different personalities? You know, we were in the casting. It was interesting because at one point I was exploring the idea of, of Billy as the Nikki character because playing against type can also work in an interesting way. But he really preferred that role. He doesn't have kids. Nikki was the, Luke was the one who was like, I love kids. So it was actually nice to have the character Gabriel play, who's the more sort of nurturing, attentive one, played by Billy, who's maybe has a more ambivalent attitude towards children and Luke playing Nikki, who's a little more removed, loving kids and having a lot of fans who are kids from some of his work. So the casting worked out nicely, but, th but thank you for that because the setup is always hard, especially when you're doing a divorce drama. Do you want to plant the seeds and as the audience understand, you're just dropped into the middle of their lives, but you need to get a sense of what has happened before so you really can empathize with them. Yeah, and to make it relatable to an audience who maybe isn't gay. And it's just, okay, how am I going to invest in these characters as just people? And I, another thing I noticed, I'll try not to get too into the weeds with this one. You, at a dinner table scene, Luke Evans talks about princesses. And I'm like, it, first I want to ask, is that, was that just Luke Evans just cheekily? Yeah, I know I was in Beauty and the Beast. No, I actually hadn't even thought of that either. But that was a, yeah, that was a line that was yeah scripted for him. And we wanted to, like you said, and from my own experience, I am gay, but I'm also a father to two sons who have helped raise. And when you start parenting, you realize you it really is just like everyone else. You the process of creating the family is different, but once you're in it, you bring in a lot of what you've learned from your own parents or by and large straight, and you're just dealing with the same things that everyone else is dealing with. So we wanted that sort of universality and that everydayness, but we also wanted to throw in a few little things that were more queer specific about it's okay to be the princess if you're a boy and that's fine too. And in fact, your dad was like that. So just a little joke that we threw yeah. in there. Yeah. The dinner scene with the friends, I thought was a particularly nice touch to be like, Hey, they're going out and talking have friends who are also going through thing things similar but also not entirely because what, what was it one of them says like oh i would never have kids but i do want to bring it 
a little bit back to the representation side of things, I think there have been un- uh, there have been a lot of attempts at LGBTQ plus representation. The most recent, I think, would be Bros, I think, Billy Eichner's film last year. So I guess what would be your thoughts on representing LGBTQ families in this film and just the experience in general? Yes, that was, I, I like I said, I'm a father. I was a sperm donor to a lesbian couple, so I helped create this queer family. And at the time, this was a, almost 20 years ago, there weren't many families doing it. So it was venturing into the unknown and it's been an adventure and it's been very exciting. So I wanted to explore that and portray that. And now, of course, there are a lot more and we haven't really seen it represented in a, in the context of a serious drama. We've seen it on some sitcoms and things like that, where it's more played for laughs, but hadn't seen, hadn't seen it done in a serious way. And we wanted, so that was important, but also, like you said, with the friend characters who are also mostly gay and they're dealing with their own sort of things, having a new child, celebrating a birthday, starting a new relationship, holding down a job that's stressful, the, those Things that they're going through are very intentionally, very mundane, just everyday things, because we wanted to make a queer film, but we didn't want it to be, we didn't want to have to explain our queerness. We wanted to be relatable to a wide audience without having it be a lesson. So, yeah. Yeah, and I think for that reason, a lot of people can connect to the divorce aspect of it. Yeah. And you fit in a nice, I don't know, I always get tripped up on phrasing if this is a double entendre or something else, but I thought it was a nice touch when Owen, they're playing a guessing game at the dinner table, and he asks, do you give up? And I thought that was just a nice little touch of, okay, this, Owen is asking, do you give up trying to guess? But between Gabriel and Nikki, it's do you give up on the relationship? So I thought th- little touches like that were nice. And I think go o- overlooked in a divorce drama, even in, say, the critically acclaimed and one of my favorite movies, Marriage Story. So, yeah, I thought that was a nice touch. And there's a bunch of lines I wrote down where I was just like, oof, next to them because they hit to the emotional core. And so let's talk about that, the emotional impact of things. How did you want to get to the heart of what the emotional core of the story was? We wanted in the writing and in the performing of the film, we wanted the actors and the characters not, we wanted to not be afraid of emotion and without becoming sentimental, of course. So that's like a tricky balance. But we wanted to show these two men being nurturing, being vulnerable, crying. But of course, you also don't want it to be too bleak. So the scenes of the friends and the birthday, the celebrations, we wanted to show the joys as well as the struggles. It is a tearjerker, so that's the end goal. But you don't want, we wanted it to end hopefully. That was important from the beginning. And and we didn't want it to be a slog for the audience. Yeah, it, it was interesting because you talk about cr- leaving room crying and there is a scene where it's just, I'm assuming, a, just a tripod aimed at Billy's, Billy Porter's character, Gabriel, and just crying and then shots over. <laughs> to the nor- oh, To include that, I think, gives it a sort of gravitas that I think which is such a weird word. Gravit- Who invented that word gravitas? But I just think it lends more to, hey, you need to feel however you need to feel, but you also need to let those emotions out when you're dealing with tough situations like this, where you're talking about, I'll go too into spoilers, who gets the time with Owen? Who gets this? Who gets that? It, it really gets down into the minutia. And what was your... Gosh, this sounds so bougie, but I'll just ask it anyway. What was your goal to to going into making this movie? Was it to talk about your own experience as a sperm donor 20 years ago or to represent something now? It was to represent something now, but you also making a movie is such a long process that you have to have something at its core that you can 
relate to personally. The goal was to, in a lot of ways, like you said, was to fill the gap. My writing partner and I are both gay and we, our first movie was, did not feature gay characters. And we just were like, we want to, it's for this second film, it was important to us to, if we're not happy with the way we're being represented, or we feel that what's out there isn't enough or is maybe not to our taste, then let's contribute something that is in our style and to our taste. And that was, and, but we wanted to make it something very contemporary, sort of even future leaning and divorce was something we hadn't seen before. It's a fairly new thing. So it felt a little zeitgeisty, but it wasn't really the divorce. It was really the things that gave us the most pleasure were the kind of more everyday, the scenes of just them hanging out with their friends or going to see their parents or taking an outing, riding the subway, just seeing these queer characters just go through life and trying to keep their heads above water like everyone else. Yeah, and I think it felt very, and this is also one of those odd words, human to go through because I'll just say I, I will not reveal the name of the film I watched last night because I'm still under embargo, but but I watched a movie last night and I'm like, and people don't talk like that. That's not even how people interact with one another. So it was nice to have you bring up the parents where that's a, that's a great scene to include because I assume one thing going into it, but another thing happens. Again, mm -hmm. dodging all kinds of spoilers left and right, but it's what makes the complete picture of this story, I think. And by the way, you're getting a probably prime spot because filmed in New York, right? And during Pride Month. So you're just getting, this is probably like the best platform other than, I don't know what other great platform you could have other than this to launch, to have your world premiere at. And Father's Day the week after. Oh, and Father's Day. So you're just going for all three of them sectors. Yeah. And, yeah. but yeah, it's, it's an astounding film. I regret to, that I didn't put this on my hidden gems list that comes out later today as of recording. And after I watched it, I was like, ah, I missed the hidden gem. But yeah, I fully recommend people go see this. It's playing, gosh, the 10th oh, at 2 p.m. Eastern at the Indeed Theater at Spring Studios. June 11th at 3.30 p.m. Eastern at the Angelica. And June 14th at 8.30 p.m. also at the Angelica. And those first on two... On Second Avenue, not the Angelica on Houston Street. Yeah, don't get it twisted. Yeah, make sure you're when you go to Google Maps, you don't go to the Angelica on 2nd Street because then they're going to be like, I don't know, do you want to see the Super Mario Brothers movie or something? <laughs> and if you have a ticket, go early. And the both the Saturday and Sunday screenings are rush only, but that, that does mean that there are tickets available. You just have to go early. And if you are a ticket holder, you have to get there 30 minutes early because they start letting the rush line in. I, yeah, was, it, I hold this on Sunday, so it's a good tip. Yeah, I think... Just based on what I'm, I'll give you the official spiel on Rush. Here's what Tribeca is say, says on their website, according to Rush. Basically, uh, Rush will be offered when advanced tickets for screening are no longer available at venues other than the Beacon Theater. The Rush system functions as a standby line that will form at the venue approximately one hour prior to the scheduled start time. So say if you're going to the 3.30 at the Angelica, arrive at 2 or 2.30. And then admittance is based on however many seats they still have left and the admins begins 10 minutes prior to the start time so about 3 20 for the june 11th screening and then rush tickets no extra cost as advanced tickets and you just pay that when you enter but bill thank you so much for your time i hope what whether people are going to drive back and i know actually some people are in drive back right now already going to pni screenings and things like that but I hope people don't, I hope I'm not too late in my coverage of this. And because I really do want people to see this movie, because I think even if you have, like I said in the beginning, I think even if you haven't had the same experiences that Gabriel or Nikki have had, I think it's, if you're a child of divorce, I think specifically you could get quite 
a lot out of it. Yeah, so I, I'd highly recommend it if you can make the flight. Or if not, I'm just telling you, go fly to New York, stand in a line for an hour, and try and get into this, because I think this will be one of my hidden gems of Tribeca 2023, even though I didn't have the time to include it in that article. But thank you so oh. much, Bill. Dang it now. So that's great. And it will be playing in other festivals around the country and released widely at some point this year or two. Yeah, maybe. Oh, gosh, who would be a good studio for this? Not Neon, but maybe IFC. Maybe I could see IFC doing that. Fingers yeah, that'd be crossed. Good. Fingers <laughs> crossed. Yeah. Have a great Tribeca, Bill. Thank you so much. 